<laughs> yeah, I'm the king. So, Brendan, quick yes. question. Your character, I find, is actually a really interesting character throughout the series. Um, it's interesting to see that in season two, it's taken a whole different path than what I thought. You know, I never read the book, so I'm basing everything off what I've seen so far. Okay. Um, you know, you see nowadays that characters like you that have two sides that they have to show now, and I definitely see that the second side is showing. What, what characteristics do you think is gonna is a big role in the second season that you're relying on? Well, okay, let me ask the two sides that I'm showing. Yeah, what do you mean? Like, uh, in terms what of characteristics what... are you gonna be using in season two? Because you're very cunning. You're almost like a Saul Goodwin. Yeah, yes. he's very. You yes. know, this guy plays on the other side of the rope. And you know what I mean? Right. That that's a that's a fundamental characteristic yes. of children yes. that w w continues. Okay. Uh, but then he also, one of the great nice things about this season is that new relationships get formed that we're able to show different sides of the characters, and particularly from uh, uh, meeting Ed and uh, seeing some of the way his relationship, uh, the relationship with Frank develops and the relationship with Ed develops, we begin to learn things about children that I think are new and that he didn't even know about himself. I think he finds himself having responses that he wasn't sure he wouldn't have imagined himself having. I think it's, he gets surprised by his own reactions in okay. some of these situations. Um, and everybody's an extremist this season. Everybody's been placed into very difficult situations. So, you know, you get to see how somebody behaves when the chips are really down. Okay. Thank you. You bet. And do you have, if, if, if you had the world situation that was brought in at the end with the possibility of a nuclear holocaust and everything like that, but your, your character is still very much focused on rooting out, you know, wrongdoers. Whatever's. Oh, is my he, character's... A, but is he taking a more global view, or does everyone have to take a more global view because of what's politically going on? Uh, I think people are coming to terms with it in real time, you know, not in real time, but in extremely tightly compressed amount of time. As we said in the panel, this, you know, this takes, the first season was a two-week period, I guess, and the second season is a two-week. Okay. You know, so, I mean, this is all happening very quickly for these characters, so it's not like they're having time to, like, ruminate about, well, I'm going to take a view this more. I mean, this is all, like, quickly reacting to things as they happen, uh, as quickly as they can. So for children, uh, children's looking out for number one in a lot of ways still, uh, but he may... I don't want to give away anything. <laughs> he may he may learn that that viewpoint of just looking out for number one, he may be able to include more, not globally, but at least more than just singularly. <laughs> he might move beyond just the singular, you know, in a certain way. So, yeah. But uh, uh, it's interesting to see how all of the react characters react to the new situations that are thrown at them. But I don't know if I would divide it in terms of, like, local versus global. Okay. Not quite it's that more sort of... Yet. No, yeah, I mean... The threat of a holocaust, you know, a nuclear holocaust, is you know certainly a global problem. But everybody's so concerned with the immediate situation of survival, whatever whatever their in immediate surroundings are, that that becomes paramount. Did that answer your question? Yeah, that did. Yeah, you're like. <laughs> I, yeah, I wasn't thinking no. of the fact that it was two weeks. I mean, that really. It's, it's happening so expected. quickly that it's no way to sort. Of, yeah, you're not you're not able to sort of philosophically take a step back. It's like you're just dealing with everything that's coming at you very quickly. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just curious, uh, and I'm sure you get this a lot, but, you know, I think every decade has always said that fascism is coming back, but we're in a very strange political climate right now. Does it feel even stranger, like, creating this show in this political climate? Well, I mean, foremost, I think it speaks to how truly timeless the novel is. I mean, you know, how prescient the novel is, um, and how, um, how incredibly um, powerful some of the fundamental thematic questions of, of the book are that we've tried to sort of lift into these these character stories we're telling. So it's it's certainly not anything that one needs to fabricate for the purposes of this series. Um, and and you know I mean it is a decidedly obviously anti-fascist show, but I think I think what what is what is so um, in some ways cunning about this type of series unique from all others is is we get to sort of try to find our points of identification and, and what decisions we would make in those kinds of circumstances and to your point those choices even as this is a different sort of historical world that they are visually living in um, those choices politically conceptually and humanly are not that different uh, and that's that's what I think when we talk about these stories and, and I mean what I love about this series is each of these characters 
are living in, in such a, a time of, of great intensity where every decision matters. Uh, matters to their survival, potentially matters to you know what effect they may have on the course of events, either within the resistance or you know obviously um, when you're talking about Berlin and some of the the, the more sort of powerful offices, um, these are decisions that will have significant ramifications. Um, so in that sense, I mean we're living in a surreal time right now, and so the surreal of this series doesn't become quite as odd. I and think, that's disturbing. <laughs> I think I think we wish it didn't reflect the world around us so much. Yeah. You know what I mean? Honestly, I think we would all be much happier with less immediate topicality. You know what I mean? With less relevance to what's happening right now. And I also think that, well, the surreality is the real point. It is why this year, this the novel is so timeless and the story itself is so timeless is that we all know that feeling of looking at the world and saying, this can't be real right now. This isn't really happening. Is this really happening? Um, and this book touch, and the book in the series touch on it so well, this feeling of not only is it happening, but there may be something else happening as well. Uh, that's extremely relevant to our time. Uh, but also that feeling of what I think this show does really beautifully is it holds up a mirror to what we're going through, but it's a funhouse mirror where everything's refracted and completely reversed. So, you know, the white people are colon colonialized, the Japanese are in power, and it, it lets you, it, it actually becomes something that allows you to emotionally experience the ramifications of what we're going through, but in this way that's even somehow amplified because of the distorted effect of it. You get to see so many more mirrors to our own world, which I think is such a beautiful thing that he did with the alternate reality, with Philip K. Dick did, yeah. and which the creators of the show have done. And, um, and, the go ahead. and the, just the inherent difficulty of those choices. I mean, you can put yourself in John Smith's shoes, you can put yourself in Frank's shoes, and I mean, it's, it's interesting in the writer's room, you know, continually positing these, these conflicts and say, but which direction would you go? I mean, if you're choosing freedom, if you're choosing protection of your family, if you're going up against these powerful institutions that you could think, you know, one person couldn't really have much of an impact at all. Um, you know, it's, it, it, it is obviously what resonates with, with the, the real travesties of World War II, but, but those are, in different formulations, some of the same things we, we personally struggle with. It's a great way to illustrate, I guess, what people forget about in movies and TVs nowadays, which is empathy. You know? Yeah, very much so. Very, and in being able to empathize with things in a way that actually set up reverberations of empathy. You know, where you can see a Western culture which has been colonialized, and that makes you think, oh, those poor... But then it says, oh, no, wait, where are the colonialized people? Well, hold on, I, what's, what, who are dis who's disenfranchised now? It just lets you see things through... It, it's again that mirroring and uh, echo echo chamber that it sets up, bouncing around in our own emotions. Is, I think it's a very powerful tool. Now, originally in the book, you know, I, I think when before the show came out, um, there was discussions about how things were being changed. Like, for example, the grasshopper mm -hmm. was turned into a film, and yeah. and there are different things that were um, changed. Obviously, we added John Smith um, as a character. Um, how do you guys make that, those decisions to you know keep with the theme, but make decisions to change things within the the book? Obviously, and as the show goes on and continues, eventually there's going to be you know no more yeah. book. But how do you kind of use that as inspiration to continue forward and, and find your own voice and stories in that? I, I mean, for, foremost, that, that was sort of fundamentally um, Frank's um, greatest, obviously, legacy um, in the way that he created the show um, was being able to find ways of drawing from the book, still being very much rooted in the DNA of the book, but adapting it in a manner that will best hopefully serve a, a compelling drama within a visual medium. And so some of those decisions were made fairly early on, but all of those things were discussed with, uh, with Issa um, and, and her team, uh, because no one wanted to fundamentally betray anything um, you know, from the novel, even as there were many aspects of that we had to change. I mean, and which you mentioned on the panel, I mean, a lot of us wanted children in the first episode because the book begins with him. But what the book doesn't have is is sort of a, a narrative construct, you know, that one could really establish to hopefully serve a long-running 
series. So in that respect, you know, they, they immediately recognize that there were going to have to be decisions made um, that reformulated uh, a lot of the ingredients and sort of um, character lines that would find an entirely different course um, in the TV show. I mean, obviously, Juliana doesn't kill Joe. You know, there's a culmination, even as open-ended as that novel is, um, that, you know, obviously we had to make some different choices. But it's the open-endedness of the book that gave us the confidence that there was an ongoing seriousness because yeah, we were really to say, interested just, to say, well, yeah. what, what happens with these characters beyond that moment? It's you know, not a, linear, a destination. It's not a linear narrative. I mean, yeah, it's, no, the book yeah. just lends itself yes. to serialization because it, it's circular in its structure, and also it's extremely short in terms of mm -hmm. what it actually covers. So it's so open. It, it doesn't. It, 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 it's like the opening half of the book. In fact, he wanted to write the second. He yeah, started. Of course, started. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, it's a, it's a launching point in itself, which makes it so much more rewarding to narrative. You know, narratively take and expand because you're not. It's not like you're taking Pride and Prejudice. Which is a beginning, of, you know, structure, Aristotelian structure, and then just exploding it. You're taking something which is just this incredible idea, and hopefully, you know, letting it flower into these fruitful, beautiful ways. What did you use um, for Robert Children? I mean, for children's character, what did you pull from? From the book? Yeah. What, what was everything. the main thing? That, everything. <laughs> oh, I mean, the book is so wonderful as a character study of this man that there, I mean, that's my touchstone. Is I want to do that justice. It's such an incredible character to get to play that I, I just want to do that book, uh, that character, uh, service. You know, I feel like, and, and I use the book as the touchstone for that in a way, because the book is so, it's such a window into his thought processes that, and it's so rich as an actor to be able to look right at that and say, okay, that's literally what he's thinking right now, um, that I want to honor that, um, while at the same time taking it and then create, and then hopefully creating, letting that impulse lead us into new uh, avenues and new storylines, which are not necessarily in the book, but honor it. Uh, question about segueing away from the show is um, you said that in the panel that it took nine years to get this done is there what is your belief that made it finally become a reason that this was picked up is it just because we have an expansion of Netflix and Amazon is it there's more outlets or I think it's a combination of things I mean thinking back to nine years if you can remember what the TV landscape looked like then <laughs> uh, how many shows were getting made and how many buyers there were I mean this is extraordinarily challenging material and I can tell you how many writers we approached who couldn't crack this um, and so our, our original um, landing in the UK with a different writer um, you know had provided one interpretation from it but there there was there was really no welcome for it when we originally took it to market in 2006 or 7. Um, when we brought it back and the, the landscape had expanded as much as it did, it opened us up obviously to more non-commercial opportunities outside of HBO and Showtime, which there weren't that many uh, back then. Um, it, had, it required a certain financial support that a lot of broadcasters really didn't have. But I think what it ultimately, ironically, provided for, for Amazon in particular is in a world of hundreds of series, there is none like this. Um, so I, I think it was the, 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 the in, in Amazon, trying to sort of aggressively maneuver into um, series on the comedy and drama side um, that have no corollary. Um, ultimately, that which people were most uh, uneasy with about the show made it what was so appealing. This will be a uh, one day release all season. Yeah. Does that change the way that the episodes are structured? Because I've heard this question before from another show producer. I'm trying to call it. They said that, you know, like, I think, you know, I don't want to use Game of Thrones, but a lot of shows, they almost end at a point where, like, damn it, I'll, when's next week start? You know what I mean? Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and sometimes now you're almost a movie. This yeah. is a movie. Yeah. 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 I mean, is it, that right it, to say? Or? It's absolutely right to yeah. say. And I'd say we're, we're still in sort of the nascent stages of learning that. Um, because it has effect on you from a from a an architectural standpoint. Um, you know, even the way that you know they're they're continually adjusting. You know, the fact that you're watching something, and as soon as the credits run, it's counting down to when it's going to start on you again. It's like you're making a choice, but you're making kind of a passive choice, which is not to shut it off, um, which is is kind of an unusual circumstance. But also having a release like this is unusual. You know, when you do Good Wife. 
you're getting audience reaction, even though you're writing ahead, you're, you're feeding off of that and you're reading off of that. Um, and you also have an opportunity to respond to how things are creatively developing. Here, as you said, it's, it's really a 10 hour film that we're putting out there. Does, uh, does it change, the, the reason I brought that up is because now a lot of reviewers and bloggers review it as a whole. Right. So you don't see an episode, like this episode was a nine, you know what I mean? It, you're almost behind the eight ball because now you have to have a full product start to finish that is a pace that, you know, for the actors it has to be tough because there's no, you know, you can't segue into a, a, a phase where you're not conveying too much action or too much content. So that's right. why I asked that. Yeah, that's a good question. No, it's, it's, it's yeah, I, I think, and, and I, I imagine some universities are starting to teach it if they're going yeah, in, probably, looking yeah. into sort of, sort of the, the 10 hour evolution. movie, the 10 hour, 20 hour movie format. Yes, yeah. it is. It is very much its own form. Yeah. And, um, and, and early on in the first year, I mean, we had a lot of conversations about it. I mean, and, and, and talking with Frank and trying to figure out, all right, well, what, what since we're, you may be working within a traditional three-act structure, obviously you have no, you have no act breaks. Um, and, and even thinking from the serialized standpoint, well, do we, do we contain our entire ensemble within each episode, or do we start segregating, which is what we experimented with this year, where certain characters we would indulge more fully, um, and you look at how much do you want to escalate each of those stories, and then what may be the climactic or, or culmination of that. Last year, I mean, we had so many episodes where we um, sort of escalated into these grand sort of you know, almost operatic montages, which was one way to try, but I think we're constantly experimenting with the, the, the grander moments and some of the more um, uh, the smaller but perhaps equally impactful uh, character moments that may, you know, you want to compel the viewer to continue through the experience. I mean, in that way, I don't think it's any different than fiction. You know, you get to the end of the chapter, are you on that ride enough to say, I want to keep going? And we're always trying to discover what the equivalent of that is. Do you, do you like that format? Are you enjoying trying to meet, meet that challenge? Or do you I, prefer other, other forms? No, I think it's fascinating. I mean, the, 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 honestly, the, the, the thrill of working on television right now is that is that from a format standpoint? It's a wild west. Yes, and it's like anything is possible. So whereas typically you hearken back to, you know, when we all lived in a traditional sort of network reality where you lived in franchise shows and it was cops, you know, and lawyers, and, and, and you knew what you had to accomplish. It was very regimented. In, I just can't get him to be quiet. I've lost my train of thought. I mean, in, in, in this, what you're saying this, is so interesting. In this world, it's servicing the story, and as long as we have enough Brennan, people go home happy. So we get a whole episode of him next season. Yeah. We're working on it, but the others keep rejecting it. Wow! wow. I'll start the hashtag. Wow. Thank you. Nice. Well done.